Hey, Hans, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time. So the first thing I want to talk about is Olympic rower. Tell me about that. How'd you get into rowing? Because I know, I mean, I grew up in Starkville, Mississippi. So there, I mean, there wasn't even volleyball where I grew up, but uh, yeah. tell, me, tell me about that. How'd you end up an Olympic rower? Yeah, I grew up in a uh, different part of the country, Seattle, Washington, specifically. And in, C in Seattle, there's water everywhere. And so rowing becomes sort of visible in a way that it's not in other other areas, because obviously you need water. And, and so my family found out you could take private rowing lessons. And we always thought that would be kind of a fun thing to do. So we went ahead and signed up uh, as a four, the four of us just to learn how to row because we'd seen all these people do it. It's kind of a, a visible known sport in Seattle. And um, I found that I enjoyed it. And that started a 12 plus year rowing career, which ended uh, at the Rio de Janeiro Olympic Games. That is really, really impressive, especially as a, an athlete myself. So you are a very successful real estate agent in the Bay Area, which we'll get to in a minute. But I kind of want to see if your mindset kind of aligns with mine. Do you attribute a lot of your success in your career, the, in your non-athletic career, to growing up in athletics and, and being a really high-level athlete? Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because the as we're recording this, the Olympic Games in Tokyo are happening as we speak. I've got my Olympic shirt on <laughs> today in honor of that. And it's it's something that I think is obvious in retrospect of, of the, all the hard work and the teamwork and the dedication and stuff. But it's something that's a lot harder for people to apply. Um, I have a lot of teammates who do very well athletically and then they don't do as well or they flounder for a while professionally. And that was something that I was keenly aware of when I stepped out of my athletic career is what made me successful at rowing and as an athlete um, would be able to make me successful at real estate in this case. And so I really actively had to apply all of those lessons that I learned, which we can get into, of course, but ultimately were really critical in my success, especially early success in my career. I've only been selling uh, real estate for just under five years, and I've been doing investing and stuff for a little less than that, actually. And um, all of that success is frankly attributable in one way or another to the skills that I learned as an athlete. I totally agree with that. So I never made it nearly as far as you did, but I did, you know, make it to the college level at Texas. And for me, where I kind of apply what I learned in athletics, like I was not necessarily just the most talented and the best. Uh, I worked the hardest, in my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, and got myself where I needed to be. So for me, especially with client work, because, you know, 80% of clients are wonderful and great to work with, but there's 20 of 20% 20 of them that are really difficult. And then, you know, there's just these that you with uh, in transactions or when you're investing, you know, come up and inspections and things that come up with, okay, maybe this won't work anymore that kind of learned growing up, like, okay, this sucks really bad. Like running sprints sucks really bad. I don't like running sprints. It, and I grew up in Mississippi and all of my high school career and college career was in the Southeast where it's 200 degrees in the summer when you're having to do <laughs> preseason. So I have a very long history of just getting through shit that sucks to get to a better mm -hmm. end, to get to the end of something. So that I totally apply that to my real estate career, uh, you know, writing books, all of it, just because it's, it's a very... Uh, it's a, a very applicable skill in almost anything, just getting through the bullshit to get to the end result. Totally. And, you know, that's a, a visual that we can all uh, relate to is like running when it's hot and it's sweaty and you can hear, hear, feel, see the heat, you know, like I think we've all felt that to some degree and getting through something that's really uncomfortable. And I think I've talked about this before with other people, but when you're negotiating, especially the price points that I am fortunate enough to work in are a 
there's a lot of zeros on the end of these transactions. There's a lot of stress. A lot of people have saved for years and years and years for the down payment and are going to sign up for a five, ten thousand dollar mortgage a month. Like there's a lot of stress involved. And 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 so when I was competing, there's a lot of stress and a lot of pressure on that one moment. And so when we're negotiating and we're writing these offers uh, or we're taking offers on a house, uh, you know, it's a pressure filled moment that if you fumble it, you could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to somebody. And, and so I realized that I had to apply those same tactics of prepping for a race and showing up on the start line, ready to go and doing the, the, the start and then into the settling part of the race. Well, uh, under pressure applied really well to, to negotiating offers at a, at a high level when everyone's freaking out you're calm, cool, and collected, or as, as much as one can be in that moment. And, and that honestly separates a lot of people from really succeeding and winning in the long run or not. Absolutely. So let's pivot from athletics to your real estate career really fast. So Hans is a very successful luxury agent in the Bay Area, which everybody compares when they're talking about real estate investing or just buying a house in general, like, well, at least we're not buying in the Bay area because that's just yeah. like, wildly <laughs> expensive. So I find that intimidating personally as a real estate agent and investor. But I think what a lot of our listeners who aren't necessarily our real estate agent listeners, but our real estate investor listeners, especially the short term mm -hmm. rental listeners, mm -hmm. uh, luxury <laughs> is expensive. Luxury is intimidating. And, but a lot of times with short term rental investing anyway, uh, people are buying luxury properties because they make more money. A lot of times they're buying mm -hmm. properties that are nicer than the houses that they live in to turn them into a short term or vacation rental. So I think this is applicable to, mm -hmm. you know, investing everything. So did you start your real estate career with luxury? Did you go right in and say, okay, I'm going to be a luxury agent or did you start just, you know, whatever you could get? <laughs> um, no, I didn't start in luxury. And, uh, I, I really, my, my first mentor in real estate was a big REO guy. He would, he, I think he did 750 REO sales in 2009 in San Diego. And he was, I think he was the number one guy in the Southeast or Southwest for REOs that year across all companies and all brokerages or something like that. And, and so he knew REOs, he knew foreclosures, he knew short sales. And that's what he taught me. Cause he's like, especially when you're starting out, you know, people don't care as much how much success you've had or how, uh, seasoned or not you are. They have a bigger problem, which is foreclosure on their, on their horizon. And they, they need a solution to that problem. And so that's where I started. And I did, I think I did nine deals my first year in the business, which doesn't sound like a lot for some markets, but in California, the average agent does seven. So I felt pretty good about that. And I actually had two more in contract that got foreclosed on when we were in escrow. That was a, that, that those hurt, but, um, that's where I started. I cut my teeth. I did whatever it took. I was cold calling. I was sending out mailers. I was door knocking sometimes. Um, and then I would just get these, these crazy situations where people were behind three, five, in one case over 10 years where they hadn't paid a mortgage payment for 10 years, and then try and figure out how to sell that house uh, and get them to not only accept the fact that they weren't going to be able to stay in their house, but then move out and hopefully get a few bucks at the end of the whole deal and then avoid the foreclosure. It was it was hairy and messy, but I cut my teeth and got a lot of experience early. Um, and then I, it's all uh, through some friends and mutual friends and friends of my wife, uh, got in contact with the top luxury team socially actually, uh, first, and then realized they were doing something cool. Cause I, I, <laughs> I had a brunch with them just to sort of connect socially. Their son was starting to row my wife and I were both Olympic rowers. And so we thought we should know each other. And um, they told me that they were trying to put $2 million of, of volume in escrow every week. And at the time I was doing, I think I did like four and a half million my first year. And so I was like, wow, 
that sounds pretty good. I, I want a piece of that. And, and that sort of evolved to, to me reaching out to them and saying what I could do for their team and how I could help them. And they luckily agreed. And, and here I am a few years later. Um, I think this year alone, I've, I'm uh, almost 41 million in volume for 2021. So it's definitely a far cry from where I started. That's amazing. So from foreclosures straight into luxury and nothing in between, right? Well, I mean, there were, you know, I've sold a bunch of condos, a bunch of first time home buyers into, you know, the price points here are all relative, right? Like the median price point in our county is almost $800,000. So um, luxury is relative around here. What's luxury in one market is entry in this market kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. um, but it provides its own set of challenges. And I, and I frankly took like what we talked about earlier, the athletic background that I had uh, and applied the hard work, the discipline, the humility, it's, the coachability. That was a big one for me uh, and, and learned as much as I could from my mentors and then went and applied it immediately. And, you know, I sold plenty of townhouses and condos for less than the median price um, until I was really, really ready to, to get up there. I think it wasn't until almost three years into my career that I did a seven figure transaction and, and then, cause it, frankly, that was a big mental barrier for me is like, Ooh, seven figures. You got to write a million at the front of that number. And I finally did one and it broke it down for me. So then I realized like, Oh, I can do this. I can, I can do a million dollar deal. This is super cool. And, and now I'm fortunate to have an average price point in the one, four something range. And then I've done a couple in the threes. I haven't done any $10 million deals yet, but that's something I, I hope to attain in my career at some point. But, um, but it's, it's amazing how it's sort of progressed slowly, but also actually pretty quickly. So one thing that I want to kind of take out of everything you just said, so let's talk a little bit about mindset and limiting beliefs. So whether you're an agent who's kind of jumping from selling a few condos and some REOs to full on luxury, uh, or an investor, what I see a lot with the limiting belief of jumping into like a luxury property, uh, is that this property that I'm buying as an investment to short term rent is nicer and more expensive than the house that I live in. And people have a really hard time getting over that hump and changing that mindset. So mm -hmm. when you made the jump into luxury, what did you have any issues like any imposter syndrome? Because I remember I did when I and my market at the time that I started was the average purchase price was like 250. It's now closer to 600. But when I did my first $700,000 deal, I, I was so nervous. I was worried that, and I knew what I was doing. I'd done, I'd probably done 10 transactions. So I knew enough, but I was so worried that this buyer was going to suddenly realize, even though I'd already invested in a bunch of properties, I totally knew what I was doing in terms of advising him on the best investment. I was so worried he was going to like discover that I don't know what I'm doing. And, um, so can you talk a little bit about, about making that shift into a, I'm going to call it a bigger, a more advanced market, like luxury versus condos and how you overcame some of that. Yeah. Imposter syndrome is real. <laughs> um, cause I was coming from, like I said, the, the foreclosure, the short sale world, and you get comfortable, you get into a lane and you, you see yourself as, as one thing. And then eventually you have to move your paradigm and expand your, expand your vision around everything and decide, uh, that you're not necessarily that person that you're, um, going to, to get uncomfortable and, and get into a new space. And frankly, that's all self-imposed. Uh, when I, I have a, a bunch of new guys on my team that I'm, I'm helping to mentor and train right now. And, and that mindset of, I'm new, so therefore I shouldn't be trusted. I mean, there's an element of that because there's risk involved. There's, you know, are you, can you actually handle this deal? But at a certain point, you know, the nuts and bolts, and then it's just a matter of, of bringing the confidence to that. And I remember specifically my first $3 million deal. We, I went out with this guy, 
Um, he, he and his wife, um, his family has a lot of money. He's wealthy himself. And, uh, we went and toured, I set up two or three tours and we walked into the second house. He drove up and he was like, I don't need to see any more houses. This is the house. And we walked through it and he's like, yep, let's go, let's go sit and have a beer and talk about what we're going to do. And I was like, like totally freaking out and sweating through my shirt and everything. And I simply, I just kept asking him questions and said, you know, what does this mean to you? And, and I ultimately, I just didn't let him know that I'd never done one of these size deals before. And he's like, okay, so I'll send you this information. Uh, I'll send you my, my bank statement and like, let's get this out like now tonight. And, and I just, almost like let it happen. I, I don't want to say that, but I, I really just like, just kind of rode the wave, even though I felt totally out of control and then it worked, we got it in the contract and then, and then we closed it. And, um, to your point, it's like at a certain point, you know, the nuts and bolts, you know, the confidence, and then it's like the self-imposed like bigness of this deal, just because there's an extra zero on it. Um, it's the same deal. Like, especially when you're talking to a client base who can afford that deal or afford that house, that 700, that million, that 3 million, whatever it is, like that's their world. And, and, and it's only big to you because you've never done it before. But if you can bring what I think is truly the fiduciary responsibility of the licenses that we carry, which is looking out for that person's best interest, advising them, being an expert advisor as much as you can, like that's how you get through those initial ones is, is worry about the steps and the process. Cause frankly, to sell a $3 million house versus a uh, $500,000 condo, like it's effectively the same. And in fact, the condo has HOAs, which are a total pain in the butt to deal with um, as opposed to the $3 million house probably doesn't. And so it's really, it's, it's, it's about the steps in the process for me. Like I, I didn't try to focus on the bigness or the large numbers and the number of zeros on the end. I just checked the boxes, did the steps that I knew, and then really tried to lean in to make sure he knew and his wife knew that I was there to like represent them and take care of them and advise them as, as best as I could. Um, and they felt that and they're friends to this day. They've invited me over a, a sense, you know, we text every so often and, and they're very happy in their $3 million amazing house. <laughs> That's awesome. So there's one key point that you just made that I think you can totally apply to anything, to investing, to anything. And what came to mind for me when you mentioned this was I wanted to get to a hundred doors. Um, you said, don't focus on the bigness of it, just check the boxes to get there. So mm -hmm. that can be applied in so many scenarios. And that is such great advice because no matter how big and scary something seems or how unattainable, I decided I wanted a hundred doors when I was making $40,000 a year. And I started, you know, started down that road, just check the boxes. I'm at 50 right now, I have another 2,500 hundred contracts. So I'm getting there. Um, and it seems really, really big, but you just have to keep putting one foot in front of the other and eventually you'll, you'll get there. So I think that's really, really sound advice for, for anything that anyone might be trying to work on. Yeah. So and it's, great. it's especially with investing, I invest myself and I do not have 50 doors. I'm at six currently. Um, but I've invested in my personal career. I own, uh, another business. Uh, outside of real estate, I do some different things in my life that I've I've put uh, time and energy into. But it's it's all about that. It's the process. It's the steps. It's learning because at the time when you were making forty grand, you probably didn't have the skills or the mindset to do a hundred doors, and you had to develop that. And you wouldn't have developed that if you were always so focused on how big that goal was and how hard it was, as opposed to how do I get two doors or how do I get five doors or whatever, whatever is appropriate for your goals in your market. And more importantly, you know, working the math backwards. I was just talking to one of my mentees this morning about this. He wants to start investing. And 
I, I was like, so what, like, what's your number? Like, what's your, what's your financial freedom number? Is it 10 grand? Is it 50 grand? What a month? What is it? And he's, he answered, I want 8% return. And I was like, dude, that's like, you're never going to like that. You can always follow that 8% or try and achieve that 8%. But like, what is that actually doing for you? What does that mean for your life? And so we started to break it down. If it, you know, if he wanted $10,000 passively at 8%, he was going to have to put in a million and a half dollars on, on the board, if you will, um, to get that cash flow return. Uh, and then I was like, okay, so over 10 years, that means you got to put 150,000 into play. How many houses do you have to sell to get your lifestyle taken care of plus 150 plus taxes, et cetera. And so it just started like being smaller chunks that he could start taking out all of a sudden. And, and it, it got him thinking in a very different way. So I think, you know, like make like reduce to the ridiculous is like a closed technique that I've read. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of people who are in sales know about it, but like, how do you, how do you reduce this giant goal of a hundred doors or 10,000 a month down into something that's very bite size, because that's how you get those little steps and those little wins. And it's the same thing with a real estate transaction. How do I write the contract appropriately? How do I, uh, how do I, you know, set up an MLS search? How do I do comps? Like all these little steps that feel big at the time, but are just check marks along the way to then being able to close this big deal or, or close on your first multifamily deal and, and build a portfolio and so forth and so on. So let's switch and talk about your investments really fast. So something that a lot of our clients and listeners do is invest out of state and a limiting belief that a lot of them have coming in is I need to be able to drive by this property. It needs to be a stone's throw away. So if there's an emergency, I can go handle it. The Bay Area is a place where you really can't, unless you're a very, very specific type of investor, invest next door to you. So can you talk a little bit about choosing a market and, and choosing to invest out of state and what it takes to do that? Yeah. So I, I live in the Bay Area. I'm in Alameda, California, which is right next to Oakland. Um, and, and as I mentioned, the, the median price points in the 800s at this point, maybe it's even higher. My, it, where I live personally in Alameda, it's over a million dollars is the median right now. The market's hot. It's crazy. Um, but that means that cash flow is basically impossible. I mean, people are trading duplexes on like three caps. It's ridiculous. And so I don't, I mean, some people seem to want these and buy these and, and have success with them, but the return goals that we had were cash flow first. We wanted to create alternative sources of income and we realized quickly that that wasn't going to happen here. So we literally just started looking at markets through bigger pockets, through just different blogs we could get a hold of it. Like where are people moving? Where is stuff affordable? Where is tech going, et cetera. Um, and we got really serious about Kansas city. We almost went out there and then we realized, wait a second, if we ever go fly to Kansas city, we're gonna have to get an airplane ticket. We're gonna have to get a rental car. We're gonna have to get an Airbnb. That's going to kill half a year of cash flow just to go out there and shop. Right. And it's like, wait a second. So where do we go anyways that, that we could start, you know, investing. And then I realized, well, I'm from Seattle Tacoma actually is the next major city south. And that hits a lot of our markers of like, it, it was very much relatively affordable. It's like a secondary market to Seattle. There's a lot of business opportunities. There's also a port, there's two colleges, and there's a military base a bit south of there. So there's like these anchors down there that just bring um, a, a tenant base who is going to want, you know, an $800, $1,200 rent. Um, for a really solid place to live and in and it looks like it's going to continue to appreciate over time um, and and <laughs> speaking of working it into your life we go to seattle three four times a year to see my friends my family go to our family reunions just have a vacation i'm actually driving up there tomorrow for a couple of weeks to spend with some family and um, now we can write all of that off as business expense because we're real estate investors there. We can go see the properties. We can walk them. We can go look for more properties. And now the tickets are expense, uh, tax deductions and the meals that we have when we're looking are tax deductions and so forth. And so we, we really decided to make it 
work for us in that way um, and build it into our life and just find a market that met our needs from a, from a numbers standpoint, but then also from a lifestyle standpoint. So in owning properties that are in a different state than you, has a situation ever arisen where you thought, oh, I really wish this was next door to me so I could deal with this? Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, maybe it would be a little easier if I was there, um, especially as a real estate agent. I here locally, I now have a Rolodex of handymen and plumbers and gardeners and all these people. And it would be really convenient to call them and say, Hey, can you go over to my rental and deal with this leaky thing or this light or whatever? Um, that would be convenient. But I basically threw just the same effort of like going on Yelp, going on bigger pockets, going on these, you know, getting referrals from one person or the next, trying people. This person screwed us over. This person was a jerk. This person is amazing. And just building that same Rolodex. I mean, it took some time. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't easy. But now we have like, if there's a handyman related thing, we have our guy. If there's a uh, an appliance that needs repairing. We've got this secondhand shop that will deliver, install, and take the old one away. You know, we've got these things that we, this, this, this Rolodex built up at this point where, frankly, there are things that come up that would be really easy for me to run over and fix, but we can just call somebody and do it. I think that the barrier to entry is high, but it's, it's not that high. It's, it's honestly higher in your mind. There are people who can do that work for reasonable amounts of money in any market. You just got to go find them. And once you find them, that, uh, like, that relationship can be 10 or 15 years and for the life of your property even. So what you're saying is that when you're investing out of state, it can be a little bit difficult to build the team that you need. But once you have that team in place, then it's easy to scale. Yeah. And I, yes, I would say that is true. Um, we're starting over with that team process because Tacoma has become uh, harder to achieve the, the returns that we've been looking for. Um, and, and we've become accustomed to with the two deals that we have there. So uh, we no longer um, are actively looking in that market because we found in this case, Cleveland, but we've looked at Pittsburgh, we've looked at a bunch of others. Um, and through recommendations of talking to other people, we've, we've found an agent and then the agent helped us find a property manager, property managers, helping us find some contractors. And, and there's these people who you can build this network around yourself. And, you know, David Green of Bigger Pockets talks about your core four. Um, but if you start with one person and then you say, who do you know that I need to know? Um, that can just scale and snowball and you build this team and this reliable group of people and it takes some active energy but you front load that effort you build those relationships and then it pays for years you know decades potentially depending on how long you own those properties and so yes there's a barrier to entry yes it's challenging but if you put it in if you put the effort in up front it'll scale it should scale very nicely yeah, I 100% agree with that. Once you have that team together, it's it's easier every time to add another property and to add another property because you already have the systems in place to just keep adding more doors. So let's talk about your course that you have coming out for luxury agents. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, one thing that I have come to realize as a real estate agent is there's a lot of people who want to pinch the commission and, and shove the agent out. And I was actually reading a, an article the other day about iBuyers and how a lot of, of um, sellers would consider strongly working with an iBuyer if it meant taking the, uh, it wasn't so much the, the price, but it was taking the headache and the, and the strain and the stress and the disruption to their life out of the equation. Like people valued that. And so what I've come to realize as a luxury agent is my value isn't so much writing contracts, although I need to know the loopholes, I need to know the, the pitfalls, et cetera, but it's the relationship and it's the trust that I build with that person to 
usher them through a process that is inherently stressful and challenging and and giving them something that they can't get by basically pushing a button. And so I have employed that in my own business and I've realized that I get referrals because of the service that I deliver. And if you want to continue to be successful in a sort of digitized economy that we're going towards, you need to be able to build that, that trust, that relationship and that process to, to usher that transaction through um, because it's so big financially for people, it's the biggest number they've probably ever transacted on of anything. They want to have that trust and they want to feel held, heard and, and helped through. And so the course is simply uh, my process of how I want to teach other people to be able to do that and access those higher end clients, serve them at a high level and, and insulate themselves from the automation essentially of, of their job and of their service because they can then deliver at a higher level and be part of the higher price points where, where that effort and that relationship and trust is valued. That really is, is great stuff because that's so true, whether you're in, um, in luxury or for me, I'm in investments, but you do have to have your clients have to have the trust in you that a, you can handle it. Or, you know, for me, it's, being able to show them what a good investment versus a bad investment looks like to make sure that they are making the best investment. Because I mean, all real estate is an investment, whether it's mm -hmm. a an investment property or a primary home, you have to, you're right, build that level of trust and show them why, you know, going with like a Zillow offer or an open door offer, what have you really is not in anyone's best interest as a seller or a buyer. And one of the things we do regularly, uh, I mean, we walk into a house, uh, I just did this yesterday, um, for a potential, probably a $2.1 million listing. And the sellers were looking at us and like, what do we do to, to create more value here? And simply it's, it, it's very obvious to us at this point because we've done enough of this and we've we've seen the transformation you can make with paint and some light fixtures and such um but it's building that relationship and that trust so that they feel good investing thirty, forty thousand dollars back into their property because they know it's going to turn into two hundred thousand dollars when it comes to offers and negotiations and 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 respecting the fact that this is their home where they have made memories and there's this intangible investment that you can't spreadsheet. You know, it's where their kids were born or raised or went to school or, you know, they, they had a, a tragedy and they had successes and they had all these things that like come into the fold that they value so dearly that then you're going to try and turn into a dollar amount at the end of it. And, and ushering someone through that process is, it's, it's really hard and it's really rewarding when you get it right, because it, it changes someone's life in a way that is hard to explain until you've really felt it. Um, but that's really what it is at its core that we're trying to do is take that, that overwhelm and that feeling and turn it into money for a seller or, or reverse, take money and turn it into the opportunity to start that journey for a buyer and when you approach it in that way, I think that that really changes the mindset and changes the marketing you do, changes the verbiage you use, changes everything about how you operate your business uh, so that simply you can be that person for somebody. 100%. So guys, check out his course that comes out in a month or two. And uh, Hans, so thank you so, so much for coming on. Where can our listeners get a hold of you? Uh, well, my, my, uh, website is Hans Struzina.com S T R U Z Y N A. Uh, and I'm all over social media. You can find me on Instagram and YouTube and Facebook. If you just type in Hans Struzina to any of that, uh, that's where I'll be. And if you're interested in the course and learning more, I am doing a little bit of free coaching ahead of the launch, um, just to really nail down the content of the course. So if that appeals to you, um, shoot me a DM or an email on my website. And I'd, I'd love to chat with you about that. Um, 
and then the course hopefully is going to launch towards the end of September 2021, and that'll be our first launch. And then we'll we'll do successive. It'll be like a live training thing for seven weeks, and then we'll close it down. We'll open it back up for the new year kind of thing. So, um, if you're uh, interested in that, um, stay tuned on the website and social media because it'll be coming. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so, so much for coming on and we'll catch you next time. Thank you.